fifth road trip. Um, I didn't fly here directly. Um, I've been traveling across America with my family. To, to start a show a little map. Um, we, we've been living in, in California for two and a half years, and we're going back to the UK. Um, and how we've driven along the red line pretty much so far. Stopping in Chicago for two weeks, um, and next stop will be New York. Um, so yeah, this is a slide which goes through some of the things I've been doing. Um, my main main job these days is working on Hadoop at Cloudera. Um, I'm an engineer working on core Hadoop, working on MapReduce mainly, which I'm going to be talking about today. As Jim said, I also wrote the um, Hadoop book, which came out in its third edition a week ago, so it's a new, brand new edition that's, that's now available. And one of the main editions in the third edition is the coverage of MapReduce 2, which I'm going to be talking about now. So if there's a MapReduce 2, what do I mean by MapReduce 1? Um, what do people, when they talk about MR1, MR2, what, what are they really talking about? Um, it is a pretty big, complicated system, but the um, MR1 is about the back end, essentially. So it's not really about the API. Um, the API is important, but when people talk about MR1, MR2, they're talking about the cluster, the, the engine that, that runs your management jobs. And so the kind of mental model that I think most people have is one that is shown on this slide. Um, the idea is that there's a kind of central job tracker um, which you submit your work to. So you, if you're running a job, um, you match your job or even high or big, essentially all of your work is submitted to the job tracker. And then there's a huge array of task trackers which will run the work needed to, to run your job. So your, the job in MapReduce is broken into tasks. And then the task trackers in the cluster will run each of those tasks in parallel. That's the high level idea of, of MapReduce. So that's MapReduce 1. MapReduce 1 is job tracker plus loads of task trackers. Okay, so what's what's wrong with MapReduce 2? What, what's third development of MapReduce 2? Um, well, the kind of background, the history is. Um, at Yahoo, in fact, where um, they were hitting scalability limits with MapReduce 1, and so they started thinking about how to design a better way of executing um, MapReduce jobs. So I'm going to go through some of the problems that were being faced by users of, of MapReduce. And so the first, first one, as I just mentioned, is scaling. And Yahoo, at the time, probably two years ago or so, um, maybe a bit more. Um, we're running some very large clusters, 4,000 node clusters, and they're hitting scalability bottlenecks in the job track. And maybe, you know, maybe that's not a big problem. Maybe I oh, will just get some more clusters rather than trying to expand the size of each cluster, just run more clusters. But that kind of goes against some of the um, good things about it. Um, be precise, some of the things like um, avoiding avoiding siloed data. So one of the things that um, organizations often see is if they, if they can put a lot of data into Hadoop, then they can do some combinations and uh, joins of different data sets um, that allows them to discover new things. And if you, if you have um, a large number of small clusters, then that kind of goes against that, that pattern because you can't necessarily join data set A with data set B because they're on different clusters and you can't, you know, it's a pain to um, copy them from one cluster to another. Different groups don't kind of get the serendipity where they can try different data sets. So going to fewer larger clusters as a general as a general trend is a, is a good thing and something that certainly we see at Cloudera as being a, um, one of the transformational things about to do. So scaling is, is an important thing even if you're um, even if you're uh, not the biggest company in the world, I guess. Um, the other thing about scaling is a 4,000 node cluster that's two years old, if you rebuilt it today to be just as powerful, um, you wouldn't need 4,000 nodes, you would need, I don't know what the number is, but it'd be less. It'd be, you know, 
thousand nodes, maybe. Um, because the hardware in the meantime has developed so much that the storage capacity, the number of cores, all of those things mean that you don't need so many nodes. So really, to keep up with, to keep building large clusters, you need to keep um, scaling Hadoop. So the job tracker um, and all of those cluster parts need to be able to scale to keep up with hardware. So that was the first main question. The second one is high availability. Um, there's a lot of talk about high availability of HTFS. Um, which has received a lot of attention and in fact um, now is pretty much solved. If you download the latest versions of Apache Hadoop, CDH, um, they all include high availability for HDFS. However, there's still an outstanding problem of high availability for MapReduce. Um, if you're running jobs and your job tracker goes down, then your jobs stop. You have to resubmit them. Um, so arguably, maybe less important than getting HTFS high availability sourced out because without that you can't even store your incoming data. Um, but still, it's, it's still important. It's, it's a problem that we want to solve. We want to have high availability of, of um, matches as well. And the problem with the job tracker is it's very, it's probably the most complicated daemon in a matches one system. It has a lot of um, complex state which is stored in memory and working out a scheme for um, storing that and restoring um, from a from a standby node is, is non-trivial. And in fact, it was it was tried and the the implementation was so complex that it wasn't recommended that people use it. It was just a piece of code that isn't really used anymore. So that was another motivation to to um, look for an improvement in MapReduce 1. And then the third motivation I'm going to talk about is um, resource utilization. So one of the things you want to do when you have a big cluster is get the most out of it. And if you just stop for a minute and think about how a MapReduce 1 job is run, you can immediately see that there are some um, um, resources aren't being fully used. So in a typical in a typical cluster, you have task trackers, as I just uh, showed in the slide, and each task tracker is kind of designated to have a certain number of map slots and a certain number of reduce slots, and that's kind of static functioning of the of the uh, hardware. So a typical example might be four map slots and four reduce slots. Now imagine that you're running a job, and you've got the whole cluster, it's just your job, and you want to run it as fast as possible. Think about what happens. When you start your job, the first thing that happens is it runs the maps. So at the beginning of the job, you're only using half the cluster, and it's, it's all yours. And so already you've left half the cluster resources on the table not being used. And then at the end of the job, when the reducers are still running and all the maps are finished, there's a period where you're only using the other half of the cluster. Now, that's a kind of oversimplified um, scenario, because of course in most clusters you're sharing and users are running different jobs at different stages, so you get a much better resource utilization. However, you still can't achieve 100% or anything like it. So, um, improving the model for resource allocation was another kind of driving factor for um, moving to something more complicated than, than matches one. And the, the system that was built, um, created at Yahoo was called yet another resource negotiator, which is commonly called YARN, so people refer to YARN. And the kind of mental model that I suggest we all have for YARN is like this. So we just relabeled some of the boxes. Instead of a job tracker, we have a resource manager. And instead of task trackers, we have node managers. So what happened to the job tracker was it's been split, its responsibilities have been split into two things. A resource manager, um, like a job tracker, um, there's only one of them per cluster and it's long lived, so it lives for as long as the cluster is being used. And what it does is the 
the job level or the application level scheduling. Um, so the terms application and job are kind of interchangeable. Application is a kind of yarn equivalent of job, but you can kind of use them interchangeably, and that probably will. Um, so its job is to, the resource manager's job is to know about the available resources on the cluster and then allocate them to anything that wants to use them. And that's all it does. And the job tracker did that as well, but it also had to kind of monitor the tasks as they were running and reschedule failed tasks. It had those extra responsibilities that have now been split out into this new thing called an application master. And an application master is um, not long -term. So it's, it's only living as long as the, the job is running. So if you run a, a job on the, on the cluster, it will start a little application master for you, which will oversee your job, um, manage the task level scheduling, monitor progress, and then once the, the job is finished, it will, it will stop. The application master will, will go away. The resource manager, of course, is continuing all this time as well, and the length of the uh, lifetime of the cluster. But this is the kind of crucial thing that allows scalability, splitting it into two pieces. Um, because now the resource manager only has to care about the number of jobs. It doesn't have to care about all these little tasks as well. So it can scale up more, have more, um, um, you'll be able to fit more jobs into memory. It doesn't have to store the tasks in memory as well. While the application master will handle all the tasks and stuff. It also helps with recovery, so high availability. Because the resource manager holds lot, a lot less state, again, it will be easier for the, for the resource manager to recover from. Um, it will be easier to write the program, write the code that, that does recovery. Okay, so that's that's what happens to the job tracker of splitting to two. The node manager, the way to think about what the node manager is, is as a generalized task tracker. Task Tracker obviously only knows about map reduce. It has this kind of fixed number of maps and reduce slot idea. Whereas a node manager is more, more general. It, it isn't a slot based model anymore, it's now a resource based model. And a resource is a kind of general concept that can be defined in various ways. Currently in, in Yarn, it's defined merely by memory. So a resource is an amount of memory that you're, that you're using. But you can see in future it could be expanded to CPUs, disk space usage, um, maybe even um, network bandwidth usage as well. But today, I should stress, it's only memory. So the kind of model for that is um, the node manager has this pool of memory, and tasks can use different amounts of memory. They can ask for various amounts. Before, in the slot based model, everything was a single slot, and there was no kind of give, there was no um, you couldn't have, if you had a, a job that wanted to use lots of memory, then that wouldn't really work. Equally, if you used less than the kind of slot size, then you were wasting memory and that was about the utilization again. This is a more kind of continuous model. Um, the, the diagram here shows basically eight gigabytes of memory in the pool. Um, there are three jobs running at the moment, two one gigabyte jobs and one two gigabyte job and then there's four gigabytes of unused memory. And so that shows that they don't all have to be the same size, and that the, um, the applications can decide how much memory they want to use. They can use less than gigabytes if they want as well. So it's more fine-grained and more continuous. One of the things that the node manager does as well to enforce this is it monitors the tasks that it's running. And if, if one of them goes over its promise limit, then it may, be, it may be killed. So that's how the node manager ensures fairness. Um, the application says, I'm going to use this amount of memory, and as long as it does use that amount of memory or less, it's fine, but if it uses more, then it may get killed. So that's the kind of enforcement model that we have in our choose to. So what I've been describing is, is uh, this kind of separation, really. A separation between the compute fabric, which is now called Yarn, 
which is the resource negotiation layer. And then the layer on top is MapReduce. So MapReduce is kind of independent of that. Um, or I should say that Yarn doesn't have that map, MapReduce in other words. Yarn is a kind of um, set of general resource management constructs. And the MapReduce implementation now uses those constructs um, for its implementation. And we can look at that as a kind of operating system kind of idea. The kernel is, is Yarn, and user space is where the applications of Yarn live. So MapReduce is just an application um, in running in user space. So why is this good? Um, it has several benefits. It means that you can run multiple versions of MapReduce now on the same cluster. Couldn't do before. Before everything was tangled up. Map just one. You know, the code was. Uh, map reduce was in the job tracker. It was in the class tracker. You couldn't, for example, fix a bug in map reduce without upgrading everything in the cluster. Potentially now you can. Certain bugs depends where they are, but uh, if they're not in yarn, that would work. But if they're in map reduce itself, then you can. You can upgrade your particular um, user space. Your particular job that's using MapReduce to use a new version of MapReduce with that bug fix and see if it works, if it does work, then you maybe can roll that out to everybody, but it allows you more, um, gives, you, gives you more freedom to try different things on the cluster and hopefully without hurting other people because Yarn is enforcing your application so it doesn't, for example, abuse the cluster, take up lots of resources, all those kinds um, it also allows for experimentation. I just talked about bug fixing, but another thing that we've seen a lot of in the last few years is the kind of popularity of MapReduce as a research platform. Um, there been lots of papers written on how to improve the performance of MapReduce, how to change the model in some way. Uh, for example, continuous MapReduce, which feeds, starts feeding the reduce from the map as soon as the map starts um, emitting output. Doing those kind of experiments is very hard in MapReduce 1 because all of the code is, is spread across the cluster, embedded in the job tracker, embedded in the, in the task trackers. Um, so for researchers, you know, they'll typically change the task tracker or job tracker code and run it on their own cluster, and that's, that, that works fine. But it's very hard to introduce that into um, more established clusters. So, this kind of separation will help experimentation, I think. And already there are applications that aren't MapReduce popping up that run on Yarn. So this is the other kind of angle. You know, any kind of new ideas in doing um, distributed um, parallel processing can be implemented as applications on Yarn. Um, if you look at the um, if you download Hadoop today, you can you can try out um, the distributed shell. Is, is the kind of other one that comes in Hadoop um, today, Hadoop MapReduce 2, and that that's a very simple kind of toy example of an application that will run. All it does is run a command on every node cluster, which is quite trivial but potentially useful. But actually, it's probably more useful as a teaching aid in how to write um, Yarn applications. There are a few others which are in various states of completion. There's an NPI application, your application, that I think was recently, um, I don't know much about it, but I noticed that someone said on the mailing list that they've got it working and there's some code available for people to try. Um, there's someone working on a master worker application, which is a bit like MapReduce, um, the map only part of MapReduce, where you, you have a bunch of work you want to do and you throw it at the cluster and the workers will the work and the master will assemble it at the end. Um, and then there's a kind of collection of graph based algorithms, and those are very different kind of processing style. And there's already two projects in Apache which are graph based there's Jura and there's Hammer. And I don't think either of them, either of them actually use Yarn yet, but those are ideal candidates for using Yarn. The 
the developers have already been looking at what yarn can give them. So it's interesting that they both kind of bootstrap MapReduce as a way of doing parallel computation. And I think they will, you know, they, they've already seen that it's, it's kind of limiting in various ways, and they'd like something more general. And yarn looks like that, that thing. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about how, how it actually works, how, how, what happens when you submit a job. Um, I'll try and contrast it to MapReduce 1 as well. The idea is that you, you've got your MapReduce program, you want to submit it. Um, what happens um, on the cluster when, when you do that? Well, the first thing that happens is it's submitted to the resource manager. Um, and the resource manager will then start a special application master to run your MapReduce program. This will be a MapReduce specific um, application master that knows how to run MapReduce. Of course, in MapReduce 1, it wouldn't have done that. It would have just run that part within the job tracker. So there wouldn't have been a step two, really. Or step two would have been within the job tracker process, the job tracker at the end. And the AM just runs as a in a container on a, on a node manager. Um, so the node manager doesn't really know it's an AM, it's just, it's just running some process. And that's what node, ma node managers do, they run processes and just check that they don't exceed their memory allocations. So the AM is, is going to run this map job. So say it's going to run 50 um, map tasks and 50 juice tasks, say. Um, the, the first thing it'll do is ask for 100 containers from the resource manager. The resource manager will, will see what's available, try and respect the locality constraints, so that that's built into the API, that it can, it can know where the data is, and so it can do that for optimization that MapReduce relies on. And the resource manager will allocate resources in some way and tell the AM what those allocations are. Um, at which point, the AM can just start running tasks. And for a MapReduce, AM, it will run the maps first and then the reduces. And then it will also take care of the failure. So if it sees that a task fails, it will perhaps go back to the resource manager to get more resources if it needs to, and then um, use that to run, use that allocation to, to run uh, a replacement task on a node manager. So basically, the AM is taking care of the life cycle of your making sure the task is finished, making sure that um, reporting progress as well. So if um, you know when you're running MapReduce, you see, you see the kind of progress to across the screen. Um, that works by the task reporting to the AM, which will report back to the client. So that's a two, kind of two hops. The task progress has to be reported to the AM, which is reported to the client. And that's actually better than MapReduce 1, because in MapReduce 1 it has to go from the task to the task tracker to the job tracker to the client, so that's three steps. So it's a, a kind of minor side note, but it's, it's an example where this architecture is slightly better. And once the, the AM has seen all the tasks completed and the job is finished, it will tell the clients and then it will exit. Example of um, an optimization called Uberization. Um, instead of, so if we go back to the previous slide, the AM will run tasks. I don't know why it's called that, but if anyone can tell me what that means, it would be useful. Um, when it, when it run ta runs tasks, it will, it will run them in another node manager's container. Um, but there's an optimization for small jobs. If you only have, say, five tasks operating on a small amount of data, they're opening starting processes on other node managers is kind of wasteful. So there's an optimization that it can do to just run them all in line, just use the existing container to run all of those a small number of tasks. Um, and this optimization is not possible in MapReduce 1 because you can't run user code in the job track. That's a no-no for stability reasons. 
no one to run code that you haven't written in the job track that's a client. I mentioned the API before. Um, still, we still want to know which APIs you can use in matches one, matches two, and so I want to kind of reinforce the point that the API is different. So, so the old API is not matches one, the new API is not matches two. Um, in fact, you can use the old API and the new API on both matches one and matches two. So um, all options are possible. Um, in case you don't know the difference between the old and the new APIs, the old API is in the map red packet, and the new API is in the map reduced packet. And there's kind of history of what happened with these, these APIs. The old API is deprecated, it's no longer deprecated, both are supported now, both work in both matches one and matches. Talk about version numbers as well. Um, this is always a confusing topic, and hopefully, we're going to be. Hopefully, I won't need to talk about this in a year's time or something because we're heading towards sanity, I hope. Um, we now have version one and version two, which is kind of understandable. People who aren't intimately involved in every mailing list discussion. Um, but basically, Ruat, branch one, Matthews one is in the in the kind of 0.20 branch, which has since been renamed to the 1, branch 1, uh, version 1.0.0 um, release. And I think it's, the, the 20 branch, branch 1 now, is, is quite an old branch, it's three years or so, and it's had a lot of development done on it. The, if you look on the diagram, I've, I've missed out some of the version numbers in the branch, but basically, since it was branched, um, security has been added. So Kerberos security has been added to Hadoop in that branch. Um, append has been added to support HBase. Other features have been added as well. Um, and basically, what happened is after all this, this time, the community voted and said, let's actually just call this Hadoop 1. It's stable, it's what everyone uses. Um, Hadoop clusters are based on, on this today. All the production Hadoop clusters are based on this branch. CDH3 is based on this branch. So that's that's where MapReduce 1 lives. Um, and it's going to continue um, to be supported, obviously, for a while, I think. And then MapReduce 2 is actually in what was originally the 23 branch, the 0 0.23. And that version number was quite confusing to people, particularly after we renamed um, Hadoop 20 to Hadoop 1. Um, and so that has, the community has recently voted to, to name that branch 2. So we have a release now which is 2.0.0 alpha, which is the latest MapReduce 2 release. At some point that will lose the alpha tag when it becomes stable and ready for production. So that means if you want to try out MapReduce 2, there are a few options. Um, you can use Apache Hadoop version 2. Um, there was a release two weeks ago or so. And you can download that from the Hadoop website. CDH4 um, is available. Um, CDH4 beta 2 is available. The GA version will be available soon. And you can, you can run MapReduce 2 using CDH4. CDH4 also supports um, MapReduce 1 as well. So if you upgrade to CDH4, you don't have to um, you don't have to stop using MapReduce 2. And in fact, we say in production you should continue to use MapReduce 1. And Cloud Error Manager is a, is a way to very easily install um, CDH on your customer. And then if you want to try MapReduce 2 um, on EC2 or, or in Cloud, you can use Apache Work that has integration now. Allowed you to spin up a um, CDA for a map use to trust the crazy. Um, so this slide just shows what you need to do if you're if you use main. Um, just in, 
case you didn't, if, if you have a Java program to compile against the Hadoop API, I recommend using this particular dependency. Um, it's called Hadoop Client, and it's, it makes it very easy to switch between version numbers. Um, so if you declare this in your your pom, then all you have to do to change um, the version numbers is just change one version number rather than change the list of dependencies, which otherwise you wouldn't do. Um, so remember this, you won't have to recompile your program, sorry, you won't have to rewrite your program, you just have to recompile against the particular version. So, what, as I said, um, MR2 is still out of space, it's still being developed, it's not recommended for use on production systems, but we would encourage you to try it out since, for example, this is why I showed this, this slide, because it shows how you can change your program to use MapGIS2 and then run some programs against MapGIS2 and see if it works for you. Um, some of the things that we're still working on in MapGIS2 are kind of rough edges and, and uh, usability bug fixes. The, and so having having feedback from people who, who've tried that with their workloads um, is really valuable feedback. So we would encourage you to, to submit that and try, so try, try your applications on MapGIS2 and give us feedback. Um, the other kind of areas are performance tuning. Um, some things, so I, I mentioned computerization, that kind of gives um, MapGIS2 an advantage for small jobs because it can do that optimization. In other areas, it's not as fast as MapGIS1 at the moment. And people are working on, on tuning the performance of MR2. Um, the, the HA work is still is not complete. I mentioned that it will be easier to, to, to make MapGIS H uh, highly available, but that work is still ongoing. And security is um, still being worked on. So there are various areas where um, work remains to be done, and that's why it's not yet ready. But we're, we're working on all these areas with the community when I say. Is there any questions from anybody? Java um, code 
code because the, the JVM is, is doing optimization that you may not even be aware of. So, you know, and any optimizations you do do might become outdated in the same way. Right. Um, so I'm not, I'm not really sure on, on, the, on the timeline. So the question is when will the small job optimization be ready for that use? Um, and I'm not sure on the timeline for, for when this will be out of alpha. Depends on the community and how fast it, it gets developed. So I, I don't have an answer for that. But the Yes, yeah, so the optimization I was talking about was the Uberization optimization, which will <coughs> run everything within a single uh, JVM. Is that an any stick to try it? No, so that's, that's been implemented. Yeah, so, uh, sorry, I didn't know that clearly. Yeah, that's, that's been, that exists now. If you download the new now and, and run MRT, you will, you will have that optimization. You have to enable it. It's not on by default. Maybe it should be. But I think, uh, See, it's an example of something where you don't want to enable that in case it causes problems. But the default is it will run it if your job has fewer than 10 or fewer maps, one reduce, and I can't remember the amount of data, but if it's less than a certain amount of data, it will, it will use that automatically. Will that affect a uh, bare scheduler? Um, no, so the question is, will that affect the fair scheduler? The, the fair scheduler, so no, that's, that's independent of scheduler. In fact, the fair scheduler is not currently in MapReduce 2. The only schedulers are the FIFO scheduler and the capacity scheduler. Is MapReduce 2 production ready? Are we going to take it, which version of which you take and deploy in production? Is it like the production ready? Like, I, I don't remember when we were moving from old API to new API, there was an online, it was not production ready, we had to pay for a stable version, we had to go to production. We started to pay with that once that was moved over. We decided to move from 0 0.18 to 2.0, that last time we had to wait for 0 0.22. So with MR version 2, do we need to wait for a certain version that been tested and certain people tried yeah. in production? Yeah, so the question is, do we have to wait for a certain version of Hadoop 2 for it to be production ready? Yeah, certainly. I mean, at the moment, as I had one of the slides saying 2.0.0 dash alpha. So I made it very clear that it's not yet ready. Um, that tag will disappear at some point in several releases time, I guess. So, um, but I mean, I should also say that many, several companies are working hard on testing it and making sure it is becoming stable. Hortonworks, Cardera, others, no doubt. So, oh, since, since you are on the other side, so I just wonder what is the timeline, whether it's like down or three months, if you want to What one of those, hopefully. Yeah. Right. You said that the same, you could use two, both the APIs for M1 and M2. Yeah. Right, so the question is, is there going to be any deprecation of the MapReduce APIs? Um, we tried that before and it wasn't very popular. I think, um, um, I don't know. I think it, it will be, it will be something that the community might discuss. I think at the moment, the, it, it is worth saying that the, map, the new API is, um, I think, almost, if not as functional as the old API. So. I think that's true now. But th that was the problem before, that it was the old API was deprecated when the new API wasn't ready to replace it. And that obviously is not acceptable. So, so now I think that feature, uh, they have feature parity. Um, but it's, I don't know, long term I would, I would like if one, um, you know, if there was only one. I, I don't know whether that's going to happen soon or not. Question? Yeah. Uh, 
So is the AM going to be another single point of failure? What is happens the, if the um, manager goes down? So the question is, is the AM a single point of failure? Um, the, the answer is no, because the, um, if you think of tasks today in, the, in ML1, if a task fails in ML1, it will, it will be rescheduled not somewhere else. And so if an, if an AM fails, you can, there are various options. The kind of the simplest thing to do, and possibly the least efficient, is to rerun the whole job. So it's not a single point failure. But the, there is already work being done, I'm not sure how to complete this, which will allow, so if, so the AM will check point, and if it um, fails halfway through, it will just be rescheduled somewhere else and pick up the next last check point. So RM is coordinating that? So if uh, something happens, uh, because that's where it's uh, pointing back, right? Yeah, maybe it is. I'm not sure actually. I mean, it's not managing the checkpointing, but if, yeah, maybe it has to know that, that it's, it's a second attempt of that of that AM. Yeah. Okay. Like, I mean, the aim having its own resource pool, then using another one. So isn't that like having a small private cluster doing that thing? Isn't it like the big? Uh, it can abuse the system if one application manager just over the job and didn't let it go, and other are there, even for the small things happens. Uh, like you know, first wrong calculation or the big input person is a small output was this thing. Isn't that going to fault the system? Another thing is from application manager is now it's going to take the data and it's going to distribute to somewhere else. Is that going to increase the network congestion? Uh, AM is for job, not for the room. But it's still it's going to clean some, on the container level, it's going to clean uh, the resources, isn't it? If so it's not, it's going to release it. So the question is about, um, can an a, I think it's right, can an AM um, kind of abuse the system by running exactly. for a long time, by taking lots of resources? Um, so the long time thing um, is, is a good point. I'm not, not sure what, if any, safeguards there are for um, penalizing a process that runs for a long time. Um, I don't think there are. So that, that's, like, that's a good example of something that might need adding to avoid um, abuse. On the other hand, you know, the AMs, the, there's only two, uh, two AMs exist at the moment, the matches one and the distributes the shell one. And if you kind of audit them and check that um, like if, so if you had a production cluster, you could lock it down for any run certain AMs, and you know that the MapReduce one doesn't abuse it in that way. The other kind of grabbing resources and, and taking an unfair number of containers is managed at the scheduler level, so the capacity scheduler can manage that kind of abuse. You can say if you have queues and pools which, which share the, the cluster resources in various ways, and that's all built into scheduling. Mm -hmm. That's, that's not a concern. But it becomes a policy decision at that point. You know, what, how do you divide up your cluster into different um, departments of the company, different groups, who gets what? And that's all pretty uh, well developed now. The capacity schedule can be that. Any more questions? Right at the back there. So, since you have the end of the Thank you. 
the AM chosen uh, when it's running on one of the worker nodes? Is it just arbitrarily chosen or is it chosen uh, depending on where the tasks are running? Um, so the question is, is the, how is the AM no kind of choice? Um, I think it's arbitrary. I mean, because there's no locality for so, um, Though I just suddenly thought hand synchronization was so if it was going to do uberization, maybe it doesn't care about locality because the data is so small for uberization. But I think the answer is it doesn't care where it is. So the question is, 
questions about will um, what are the kind of guarantees of parts uh, being built if they go over there? Um, so yeah, I, I use the phrase of a build. Yeah. Okay. So the point is, if it, if it stays over that uh, memory usage for a certain amount of time, then it, it will be killed. Oh, so it has nothing to do with the. Uh, it's all about sampling. Like no, it's not. It was more my way. The reason I use that word was because theoretically it could exceed that memory allowance for a second, not be noticed, and then get away with it. But no, if it, if it persistently uses that amount of memory, more than. So the idea is that you have a yarn cluster and on especially if you run different um, yarn applications side by side. You can certainly run so like this new MPI application. Maybe a good example you can run an MPI application at the same time as running a Hadoop application on the same cluster. So the MPI is the same as that? Yeah. That's right. So MapReduce in this new model is a application that's not equal to the team. Garmin, just shell, so graph based presence in great mode. You could do, yeah. Um, I don't know very much about how to access it. I don't think so, because it's only you know, I need to buy work from a photo question last month. But it was a, a, a Jira I think too has So the question is, if a task fails, whose responsibility is it to restart it? Is the application masters? Yeah, the, the, that's the, the big difference. In, in the old world, it would be the job tracker, but the resource manager doesn't care about failure. Yep. Yep, it's the responsibility of the AI. The monitoring of the task is now done by the AM. The resource manager doesn't care about the task. All it cares about is the amount of available um, resources on the cluster. So it doesn't care what people are doing with them, I guess. Good question. Um, so, Jira has the question. The current limitation is around 4,000 nodes within the RV1. Uh, I believe that's the, around the largest cluster that I'm aware of. And Scalability is one of the stated benefits of MRV2. Do you know what the largest cluster running MRV2 is that's been tested? Um, I seem to remember a room talking about 6,000 nodes. I, I, I know remember. that was the goal, but yeah. did it actually happen? I can't remember whether that is what actually happened. I can't remember. Yeah. We could ask the room. Follow up.
so the question is how is the difference between how logs are written in MR1 and MR2. Um, well, all of the um, logs that are kind of used placing, like the standard out and standard error, anything that the task produces are all the same. Anything that the resource manager, node manager, the application master logs kind of like the job tracker logs is slightly different. So that's a good question. I mean that's kind of the type of question I guess. Anything that's is a daemon or not the user side is full of change to anything that's user side or might be the same. Okay, how many questions? everybody. Thanks a lot for coming. Uh, I just want to give some thank you uh, number one for Tom White to come to visit us and uh, give a talk. Uh, I'd like to give a big thank you to Nokia and specifically Jason Williams for helping coordinate everything. Uh, finding some nominees to carry the drinks up for us and to get the food ordered for everybody. So if everybody can give them a hand, we really appreciate that. I'd like to give a thanks to Cloudera for purchasing all the drinks for everybody here and for ensuring that Tom was able to get here on time for us and be able to talk to everybody. A um, couple little notes for everybody. We are over 700 members now. Um, this was, in fact, our largest turnout for a Chug Meetup. Um, details specifically. If there are topics you want to hear talked about at future Chugs, let us know on the Meetup. Uh, it's very important for us to be able to get these things scheduled and to make sure that we've got topics that are relevant to everybody. And with the fact that our meetup is growing so large, this is a good time to get your voice heard and let us know what types of things you want to hear talked about at these meetups. So again, if everybody can give a round of applause for Tom, really appreciate it for now. <laughs>